Well, hello, folks. You know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it means it's time for another edition of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Blefsterini in the home game and Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. And I've got the best freaking job in the world because I get to hang out here every week uh, with my poker friends, talking to fun and amazing people in the world of poker. And because of most of what we do here at Rec Poker is free, we're a largely volunteer organization. I got to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino and Website Mark over at uh, Website Amp. And of course, I also have to thank our premium members, like one of our newest premium members, Oliver Blouth. Oliver uh, joined uh, last week. I haven't had a chance to meet him yet. But I'm looking forward to getting to know Oliver better and showing him all that uh, his new premium membership at Rec Poker has to offer. So uh, thank you, Oliver. And thanks to all our free community members. If you don't know what Rec Poker is about, it's a free community. We play live. We play it online. We learn together. We learn from each other's mistakes. We study together. We have fun. And we, uh, we do it the right way. It's free to join. Uh, just go to rec.poker and sign up. All it takes is an email address and a smile. But that's enough about me because it takes a village to do what we do here at Rec Poker. Um, that's why I'm joined here every week by the Wrecking Crew, several members thereof at least. Um, to, uh, this is the core team of folks here that contribute their time every month, putting our strategy videos together and uh, adding their insights to the podcast. So if you want to find out more about the Wrecking Crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew, or you can just listen up because you're going to meet a few of them right now. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5v5 on Twitter or 5 by 5 in the Poker Stars home game. And I'm John Somsky. I am Poker Geek MN everywhere. I'm Kim Kilroy. I am currently Pet Bat 33 on the Poker Stars home game and Pet Bat underscore 33 on Twitter. And I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50, just about everywhere. <laughs> and we are going to be interviewing uh, Matt Berkey tonight, um, longtime uh, pro, friend of the show, founder of the Solve for Why Academy. And if you stick around to the end of the show, uh, just like we do every week, we're going to give away a prize. It's free to enter. Um, the prize this week is going to be a free month of access to Solve for Why uh, brought to you by Matt Berkey. So I'm excited for that. And I'm excited to be welcoming Matt Berkey back to the show. Matt, you, thank you so much for coming back on the Rec Poker Podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, now you have, you've sort of traveled all over the poker sphere. Um, you were a player forever. I know you've done a ton of coaching um, solve for why is really the the feather in your cap but even solve for why has sort of changed a bit over the years I know now you're really focusing on the academy um, why don't you just tell me a little bit about like what what you're up to right now in the world of poker oh man it's tough to say it, it seems like it changes so so frequently but uh, the thing that I don't think anybody really prepares for whenever you enter this game professionally or take it as a serious hobby is that as you graduate through the stakes uh, there's just less less availability to play. So, um, you know, over the past 10 years or so, I really started playing uh, high stakes live and year over year, those games uh, just become a little bit less available. Uh, so I would say probably over the last year or so, um, my hours have been cut a little bit more. So I've leaned a little bit more into the business side of things. Uh, I've also leaned a little bit more into tournament study because that seems to be the area of of the poker uh, economy that's growing the fastest and is the most readily available. Uh, so I think it's important to kind of be sharp in, in all aspects of the game, not just have one little niche area that you want to be good at. And what has that meant for Solve for Why? Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what Solve for Why started uh, with and sort of how it's progressed and evolved over, the, over time? Yeah, sure. Um, so we launched the company in 2016, and the idea was that there just wasn't really anything that was very live focused. Uh, I know Crush Live Poker existed at the time, but even that was just mostly like a hand review type of uh, site that was utilizing the live at the bike footage uh, as as a means to teach through application. Um, so we really wanted to target people who were hitting that plateau in their career that maybe have been two five grinders for too long and, and couldn't really find a path to elevating through the stakes. Uh, it was kind of a, a methodology for me to attempt to duplicate or replicate uh, the way that I learned the game. Hmm. And at that point, we only had the Academy as a product. So uh, we initially launched in 2016. We ran two academies pretty successfully. 2017, uh, we expanded out and ran more. And then by 2018, we realized that there was a need for continued education. 
uh, and moreover, that the landscape was very quickly changing. So the uh, evolution of the academy began as me just speaking pretty candidly about how I thought about the game and the way that I went about digesting information and learning and testing new stuff all the way to present day where, um, you know, we've pretty much built a bulletproof list of protocols that students can kind of adhere to, to create a logical framework in the way that they think and solve problems anytime they're at the table. Uh, so obviously this is a lot of a byproduct of, uh, computers and sims being a big part of the landscape whereas in 2016 i think we were like one year into po solver existing mm -hmm. and you know for the most part the best players in the game were the ones who could intuitively uh come up with some of these solutions on the fly so that was the way that the game was taught um now we have a lot more empirical knowledge of the underlying math of the game and we have these kind of anchors and uh bullet points to defer back to so everything now is kind of built off of the fundamentals of game theory and uh, the logical framework that it provides still allowing for a lot of freedom whenever it comes to how we interpret that math and how it applies in real time. Because the fact of the matter is the solvers are only as good as the parameters that you enter mm. and it's impossible to have perfect information in an imperfect game. So we're kind of just estimating whenever we're looking at vacuum situations and uh, we're trying to extrapolate off of, the data that we receive, but we suck at that as humans. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's just not something where our brains are really wired for, you know? Yep. So um, I'll, uh, as I say every week, if you're in the YouTube chat, feel free to type uh, your questions into there and uh, we'll get your answers. We'll get your question in front of Matt freaking Berkey. That's why you got to come on here to the Rec Poker podcast live recordings on Monday nights at 730 Eastern. Um, and of course, anyone here in the uh, panel that wants to uh, ask any questions, just unmute and I'll, I'll call on you in a moment. So Matt, one of the things that you were talking about there that really interested me was this kind of framework for learning that you were describing. Um, because the way that people approach the science of learning, like the process of learning, I feel like that really informs curriculum and, and how we bring people along. Uh, how did I, how did you, how, how did you and your team kind of decide what was the best way to approach poker learning and like, or, or like what what's the best way to build the track for someone to come along? Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, I got very lucky with who I surrounded myself with Christian and I uh, we've kind of reverse engineered this game from the beginning. We've, mm. we've learned kid aesthetically and then have kind of like reverted back to uh, seeing how that attributes to the underlying math as more and more is discovered. Whereas Matt hunt and Landon come from a much more solver based uh, background and they kind of learn the game from the micro to the macro. So for Christian and I, it's always just like basic principles big macro concepts that we are constantly whittling down to uh, more precision by asking deeper questions. We follow the scientific method, if you will. Um, but for us, you know, everything begins with a hypothesis. Uh, for guys like Landon and Hunt that I would consider like technicians, they kind of reverse engineer the scientific method, if you will. So they kind of start by testing, right? Where you just get a spot and you look at it in the solver, that's kind of the testing phase. And then you start to deduce some things as you recognize uh, patterns, as you recognize uh, shifts in the math, the equilibriums, uh, how equity moves dependent upon turn and river distributions, things of that nature. And then they arrive at bigger picture points. So for us, it's, it's, it's pretty fortunate in the sense that we have the methodology moving in both directions, right? We have guys mm -hmm. that are really strong at the macro concepts and guys that are really precise at the micro concepts. And that kind of allowed us to brainstorm and just build out protocols that in real time, if you're not sharp one way or the other, you'll have something to defer to. So if you're the type of person who's looked at 10,000 Sims, but you haven't really figured out what those patterns mean yet, or uh, you haven't, you haven't been able to bucket uh, the math into certain qualitative uh, buckets, if you will. Uh, so you could branch out and have more general strategies. Well, Matt and Landon will speak to you on that, right? It, it'll be there's a there's a precise betting structure that we can take dependent upon board texture and the other variables that are available. And if you're not really good with details like myself, uh, Christian and I speak a lot more to those big picture macro concepts of, you know, we're, we're off of the always and never path and we're more so in the in general type of speak. And uh, we're asking more questions than providing answers because that's what these tools are mostly utilized for. 
right? Uh, you shouldn't walk away from running a sim with a hypothesis that you had in place and walk away and say, okay, I proved my hypothesis because you, you technically didn't. Uh, for all the information that we have on No Limit Hold'em right now, nothing is really concrete. Like nothing is really discovered as law, maybe EV to some degree, but like even the, the depth through which that calculation takes place is very difficult to nail down because of how variable in nature it is. Uh, so really what, what it is, is you, you hypothesize, you test, you then reframe your hypothesis in a slightly different way to skew the variables slightly differently. And then you test again. And now we look for consistencies and inconsistencies. That's where we start to arrive at more concrete ideas. Well, I mean, that's, that's exactly a scientific process. I mean, it's great to see that kind of uh, uh, scrutiny and um, <clears throat> meticulousness being taken to the lab of poker strategy. Um, I think a lot of recreational players, they get into this. It's a fun game. Um, we want, it's more fun when you win. So we like to sure. get better and to, you know, find ways to win. Um, and we like those kind of general rules too, like you're talking about. And I, I think you're right on when you say like, you don't prove things, but you can disprove things. Yes. Um, with, with that in mind, what do you think are some one or two common misconceptions that recreational players have that um, your study or your analysis is, has uh, given you a chance to like pull the, pull the blindfold off and say, aha, uh, well, give me an example or two of that. So I, I think the most common example of uh, a misconception that recreationals will hold on to is that there's a perfect answer. So mm -hmm. because they think in such specific terms to the spot that they're in, uh, they think that there's a perfect way to play jacks based off <laughs> of the, ac the action that's taken place, right? When the reality is uh, we can't control outcomes, we can only control the EV of our decisions. And quite frequently, a hand like jacks is just near the top of our range, and you really can't mess it up right? Uh, the only way you can mess up is by generally folding, right? Putting yourself in a position, backing yourself into a position where folding becomes the correct play. It means that you've made a bunch of missteps along the way. So uh, an easy notion for this is sizing up so much preflop that uh, jacks, quote unquote, get the protection that they need from overcards, right? What ultimately ends up happening is you fold out worse and then you get better to play back against you, putting you in a position to now fold a high EV hand, right? So uh, I think what ultimately happens whenever you want that simplification is that you steer yourself into negative EV decision points in order to make them easier, right? Because a negative EV decision is pretty easily felt. You know when bottom pair is no good. You recognize when uh, you're getting the wrong price for a draw. And you put in enough money to quote unquote, see where you're at with jacks to where whenever you get shoved on, you can understand that like this hand isn't really worth anything to me any longer. And since folding is zero EV, I'll take the, the lesser of two evils, right? The problem is, is that the mistake occurred up until that point. So you made a negative EV sizing that led to a response. Well, let, let's say you made the lowest EV sizing whenever you choose the big size. And it led to a negative EV response to where the, the range that is now playing back at you is exploitative. It, it lacks bluffs because it doesn't need it, right? Uh, it just forces you into a window where you can no longer play your hand profitably. So that kind of ties into, we, we hear this all the time, like you've you know allowed your opponent to play perfectly against you because they're folding everything worse and they're only continuing with, with better hands. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people talk to me about that and, and there's some tension between that and the idea of like adding fold equity to your hand by shoving with a hand that maybe will get better hands uh, to fold. Can you just kind of explain that tension a little bit or, or maybe yeah. why people get caught in that mindset? I think what happens is that people don't understand how high in equity uh, some of the middling strong hands actually are. Uh, so for instance, if we look at a board texture like 963, what would you estimate the equity of a hand like Ace-9 to be? Uh, let me see. Ace nine on nine, six, three. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. And that's gotta be over 50. What does what yeah. the rest of the group here think? 55, 60%. They're putting me on the spot. Let's go with that, Matt. <laughs> yeah. In a single race pot, uh, ACE nine versus a single defender is, is often going to be somewhere in like the 65 to 70 percentile mm. range, right? It's, it's akin to an overpair. Uh, largely because the defender doesn't have over pairs and sets are really hard to make. So on a board texture like this, where two pair doesn't exist, sets are rare, 
and over pairs basically don't exist. A nine is a very, very, very strong hand. Uh, what would you estimate a hand like uh, 10 nine to be, for example? Probably still pretty close to that, I would say. Yeah. And I think that's where the misconception goes, goes awry is that there are people who look at that board texture and they see nine X and they overvalue it to the point where uh, they recognize that it's vulnerable and that it's also high EV, right? And they overplay it because they want to fold out anything that could potentially uh, suck out on them, right? And then there's this other camp that recognizes that it's actually a hand that's beaten very easily on this board texture through turns and rivers. And they don't play it aggressively enough because they don't recognize that, like they, they see a huge difference between aces and ace nine in this particular spot. The reality is that uh, they're not that far apart whenever you're up against a range that's largely devoid of overpairs. And they both rank incredibly high on the EV side of things. So uh, that's the first misconception is people don't understand the actual spectrum of equity. Like they don't understand how strong a six is on this particular texture, that it's like 50 plus percent equity. They don't understand that Jack 10 versus mm. uh, a defending range here is going to be like 40% equity, right? Uh, it's, it's largely misunderstood where our equity comes from and why hands that are high in equity have to fold. Like Jack 10, if played back against, has to fold because it can't realize, right? It has no path to, to sucking out basically. But that doesn't mean that it's a, a nothing hand. We often like look at a, a, a hand that misses and we call it garbage or we say it's, it's nothing, right? Implying that it's like zero equity or, or damn near zero. Reality is it's actually quite high comparatively. Like deuces on 963 rainbow in a single race pot, close to 50%. <laughs> I, I think most people though would treat that hand as like an utter throwaway. It's a give up. Right. And that speaks to equity realization properties. If, if you start putting in big bets with deuces, you're obviously only getting called by better. And that's a problem. Also, it may be 50% on this street, but the pot's not going to check down. Uh, your opponent's going to get to realize portions of their equity. You're not going to be able to get value, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's, that's all one side of the coin. The flip side, and this is where the majority of the mistakes come into play, is this notion that we can control fold equity. And this just comes from a, a misunderstanding of ranges, right? So going back to the Jack's example, that mistake occurs because you're thinking of a singular hand. You're not thinking of the incentive of your range as a whole, right? You're just thinking of how you can protect this one singular hand. Same thing happens with a nine. With aces, you don't have that much fear, right? You just know you have a pretty nutted hand. With ace nine, you're afraid of getting sucked out on. So you fast play and you go for these protection sizes. And for what it's worth on this texture, that's actually correct. But... It's important to understand the reasoning why. So whenever we get wrapped up in this singularity where we're only focused on the exact candidate, we lose focus of the greater picture of the entirety of the range. And this is important more so for understanding the response than it is our own actual strategy. If we, uh, to truth be told, like at the highest level, we're not playing range versus range in our strategy. We're actually playing hand versus range, but it takes being able to comprehend your own range before you can start to think about your opponents, right? So the reason why people make these fold equity errors is because they have no knowledge whatsoever of their opposition's range. They don't think that way, right? They just look at the board texture and they say, okay, nine, six, three, he could have five, four, he could have seven, eight, he could have a nine, he could have a six, he could have a three, he could have sets. And like, that's it. That's, that's as far as the thought process goes. It never goes as far as like what backdoor hands are incentivized to continue, uh, what types of suited versus unsuited cards. Like we need the entirety of the range because the fact of the matter is in theory land, there's like no bet that you can make that starts to apply so much pressure to one pair that they have to start instantly folding on the flop, right? Outside of like all in. And this is generally true. Like, uh, an example I give at the Academy, uh, Kim may be able to attest to this. She's been a couple of times. Uh, one of the examples I give is, say you're facing an all-in on a similar board texture, 963, two-tone, and you hold the nut flush draw. How often should you fold, if ever? Personally, I'm allergic to folding in that situation, so I'm probably not the right person to ask. It's fair. Well, uh, so generally speaking, let's say let's say somebody shoves for three times the pot size who here would fold the nut flush draw in that sort of texture 
that I mean, that's really good that you guys at least have hesitation because the general consensus is like, yes, I would insta fold, right? But mm-hmm. the nut flush draw in this particular scenario versus a range of hands is close to a coin flip and there's dead money in the pot. So we can never be worse than 50% equity. It's impossible. As long as, we, as long as there are blinds, we'll always be getting laid uh, the right price to, to at least have 50%, right? So in that instance, it becomes a huge mistake now to be folding the nut flush draw. But people will jam like queens for like 3x pot on 963 two-tone because they don't want to get sucked out on by a nut flush draw, not <laughs> understanding that they're not even denying anything. So the point I'm trying to arrive at here is you don't have any control over the range of hands that folds. It just slightly expands and contracts based off the price that you laid. So if you bet quarter pot, they only fold like 15% of their hands, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, depending on the board texture. Uh, And it's just a matter of if they can meet MDF, right? Minimum defense frequency. So like on king, king, deuce, it becomes really hard for the big blind to meet minimum defense frequency on the flop. And if you bet quarter pot, they're probably overfolding by a significant chunk. Maybe they're only calling like uh, like 70% of hands instead of like 85. Um, but on most textures, they'll meet MDF. And when the, you bet quarter pot, they're supposed to call with roughly like 80, 85%. When you bet full pot, they're still supposed to call with like 66% of hands. Or uh, sorry, they're still supposed to call, yeah, 66% of hands, right? So... All you've done now is double their folding range, but it's a wide range. So it's not like middle pair suddenly becomes a part of that 66%, right? It's not like open enders start becoming part of that 66%. Uh, There's there's still plenty of automatic continues. And that's where I think people are confused because for decades, if we bet big, top pair would fold. And that's just changed now that we've been able to examine this at uh, a, a much deeper level, seeing how the math actually works and where we're actually generating EV from. Yeah, so they're going to fold more, but they're going to be folding more of the hands that you were maybe ahead of already or that you were doing better uh, equity wise against. Um, so it doesn't actually help you. They're not folding the hands that you want them to fold Correct. Um, when, when you make that. So um, I think our listeners that were listening along, um, I think what they've heard is if you have the nut flush draw, you should just always call every bet. Um, are there times where we might choose not to call or where we might choose to raise instead or something like that? Just g- yeah. give us something easy to follow, man. Yeah, of course. So uh, multi-way pots really monkey wrench this, and I'm sure a lot of you are, common, are accustomed to playing multi-way pots. So uh, in those instances, it becomes a little bit weird. But again, remember that like there's almost nothing that can happen where you're going to get laid such a poor price that you're going to be forced into folding. So even if it goes like big bet and you call and then somebody jams behind you, uh, you're still probably just going to get the right price to call call. Uh, so like on the flop specifically, it's really difficult to outprice the nut flush draw. Now, obviously this will change if you have like the naked ace of clubs and it's like a jack 10, nine, all club board. That's not the same. Uh, a, you're not even drawing to the nuts. B, uh, there are fewer outs. Uh, as for all the money to go in, the equity threshold is now higher. So they need to have higher qualifying hands. Um, As far Mm. as like when to raise, when not to, uh, you just want to lean on on very specific things. Like if we have the nut flush draw, we have some showdown value with ace high. So what types of textures would it behoove us to sacrifice the showdown value of ace high in order to get potentially better to fold? And the simple answer to that would be, well, we have a bad kicker. We think like ace king or ace queen will fold. Right. So Jack 10 high boards are bad to do this on, but like a nine high board an eight high board, a seven high board, a lot better to now be check raising than up flush draw, because what we're doing is we're pushing them off hands that dominate us uh, at showdown. Should this hand just like play to checking, checking down Um, on turn, of course, there are going to be plenty of scenarios where we can be outpriced. We only have one card to come. So uh, our realization goes down as does our equity. So now all of a sudden, if we start facing like 2x pot on the turn, nut flush draws often have to either bluff or fold. And that's okay. That's that's part of the game. Uh, it's difficult for people to polarize in such a manner consistently. Like sometimes you'll just be denied your equity and that's okay. That's true. But I'm soaking this up. I'm loving this interview so far. Chris Jones, uh, what do you have up for our man, uh, Matt Burke here? Well, Matt, I've got uh, two questions that are kind of related. One's from the audience and one's kind of from from my perspective um you mentioned way at the beginning of the interview the idea i mean i think a lot of players even recreational players now have access 
to charts and sims and maybe have some fundamental understanding or maybe not maybe they're just looking at charts and following along but the idea that you said at the beginning is they're only as good as the inputs we put into them and one of the things i really have really valued about some of the solve for why content especially some of the stuff that matt hunt's been doing lately is looking at not just okay here it is at equilibrium but here it is when we're facing an opponent who will never be you know, never be three betting us with a with a polarized range. They're just going to be three betting us with, you know, the top of range. And how does that change how we so like I really like that approach and I'm really interested in in learning more about that. But I'm curious about sort of as a follow-up to that, you know, how do you approach reading players at the table and and deciding are they this kind of player that I can make that adjustment towards um and then i have a follow-up which is related from an audience question sure um i think it's a really good question uh this is something that uh we've started to incorporate more in the academy now that we have dynamic ranges uh on the solve for why site uh so one of the big things that that needs to be understood is that we can we can predict patterns of humans with relative accuracy like not anywhere near hundred percent, but like 75% accurate is like pretty accurate. Right. Um, and when it comes to live, like mixing preflop just isn't really all that necessary. You could just like round your ranges out where if uh, a mixing candidate is like a high frequency, open, low frequency fold, just raise it. If it's a low frequency, open, high frequency fold, just fold it, that type of stuff. Um, but through our observation and through conversation, we can kind of gauge how studied or unstudied somebody is and pick up off what their tendencies are likely to be. So there are plenty of people just through conversation and through watching their actions, you can recognize they're way too loose pre-flop and then way too tight post-flop, right? And what that will allow us to do is we can still look at a chart and we can just change the positioning in order to reflect the ranges that they're likely to play, right? So if you have a guy who's willing to flat uh, pretty much from every position and three bets too tightly, what you can look at is uh, a button range, right? And now no matter where you open from, you can just take that opening position and look at what the button response is and apply it to John Doe, who has that tendency, right? So it doesn't matter if he's under the gun one or cut off or button, he's probably pretty inelastic and just plays the same strategy from all positions. And from that, we can now decipher how to move forward post-flop because that's the most critical aspect that I think people miss. The only reason pre-flop ranges matter to us are they allow us to... Uh, curate and uh, calibrate our post-flop study. We can't study post-flop without inputting ranges, right? And I could just estimate a bunch of ranges and do a bunch of studying. And this is what was largely done in like 2016 to 2019. And my strategy will look wildly different than uh, an OTB Red Baron who's putting in ranges for what he believes his six max online game to be. And they're just not going to parallel one another at all. I might be able to open like 22% under the gun where he's opening like 12, right? Uh, this is this is critical. Uh, again, like I'm reverse engineering, right? When I first started the academy, I would just speak in general terms and just say like, look, I open the same range from all positions because nobody responds differently. They're all inelastic. They play the exact same ranges regardless of what position they're in. If everybody's ignoring position and I feel I have a post-flop edge, then I'm just going to V-pip as much as I can. Now that's changed a lot because people have seen charts and they see where the boundaries lie. So they recognize that like, you know, uh, suited Kings become stronger, the later in position that you may be suited connectors become weaker, the earlier in position that you may be that type of stuff. And we start to see these patterns emerge. Uh, so what becomes critical then is being mindful of how your strategy will shift dependent upon the type of opponent that you're at. Right. So you can study for the general case, and this is largely what I do, but you better spend some time also looking at the guy who only plays button ranges from all spots and then study the guy who only plays under the gun one ranges from all spots, like the three bet folder where he just has no flats ever. Uh, you know, you, you don't really need to be precise with what the tr quote unquote true equilibrium is. If your environment never plays that equilibrium, yeah. because ultimately you're giving back a ton of EV. We have to remember that theoretical study and theoretical ranges are just an abstraction. So we are greatly reducing uh, a lot of the details and the variables in order to get something that a computer can actually come up with. And as a byproduct of that, 
we are creating a minimally uh, exploitative strategy. So basically it's maximally defensive against uh, anybody coming after us uh, through obvious exploits. But just because we don't have obvious exploits doesn't mean that there aren't exploits available and sometimes natural ones, right? We might just overfold to the guy who three bets way too widely because we, we, we don't care to acknowledge what he's doing and don't care to make any adjustments as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's that, thank you. That's a great answer. And then kind of to follow up on this, um, I think it's sort of related to like, there's this, this sense of like, okay, we're going to study all these folks. We're going to kind of learn about the charts. We're going to learn, we're going to kind of like dig in and think about, okay, against this type of player, I'm going to do X and against this type of player, I'm going to do Y. And then we're sitting at the table and something happens. And here, so this is the, the uh, question from our audience member from Dark Angel is, um, how do you take consideration body language and tells, or do you just simply go with your sort of like the stuff that you're working on and your, the math side of it? How, how much do you, take into account behavior at the table. Yeah, uh, big shout out to Donna. Uh, it's good to see her in the chat. Um, I think I think in the past I had put more weight into this, but mainly because strategy was less, um, I don't wanna say figured out, that's not fair to where we're at in the current learning stage, but strategy was less planned. It was less uh, organized. And as a byproduct, you would just land in a lot of very close decisions where you didn't necessarily know what was going on. You had to rely a lot on your observation and on the environment. And a lot of money was just able to be made because ranges were very unprotected. So, uh, and this probably still happens at a lot of the lower state games as is, when people cap themselves early in hand, you absolutely should take the most incentivized action, whether that's overfolding, overcalling, over bluffing, whatever, right? Like you should just always take advantage of when people turn their range face up and you become somewhat clairvoyant to them either lacking bluffs or having too many bluffs, uh, being too value concentrated, whatever the case may be, you should absolutely respond accordingly. Um, but understand that that just means that your bluff catchers shift dramatically, right? So hands that are zero EV in theory, if a person is under bluffing, become negative EV to now bluff catch with, right? Whereas in theory, if it's zero EV, then it's indifferent and you'll bluff catch some of the time and you'll fold some of the time. If it's a plus EV bluff catcher, then it probably just becomes zero EV if they lack bluffs. In other words, now what matters to us profiting is how thinly do they value bet, right? And the truth of the matter is uh, people who lack bluffs tend to expand their value bets as, as a, a means of recourse to uh to, to kind of getting enough value, right? Because the only way the top of range can perform is if there is some bottom that exists. Now, the exception to this would be like the old man coffee type who every time he puts a chip in the pot, you know, he's absolutely nutted, but everybody knows the response to that type of person, right? Uh, sorry, Rob, uh, we're, we're gonna have to work on that. Just, he tells a just, good story but that's a, i think that's an image play as far as I'm yeah concerned. yeah i mean if we just get you the the suited will aces and let you <laughs> rocket it off every time you get them dealt you're fine uh, but yeah so uh it, it's very critical uh to donna's question to be observant right but the more strategic and the more sound your strategy is the less incentive there is to deviate without some sort of environmental cue when people make it obvious to me that I should shift off of my, my default strategy, I just do so. And otherwise, I'll use it as a weighted coin because the fact is I'm gonna land on river in a lot of situations with hands that mix, call and fold, right? And what I need to do or what I need to understand is that I can't always call and I can't always fold because then I become hyper exploitable, but it's live poker. I have more information available to me. So I'll use tells in that instance to lean into the always call or the always fold because I don't want to randomize. Randomization is only necessary if we're playing in equilibrium, but we're not. I know for a fact the person making the wager is imbalanced because he's human. And it's just a matter of like how studied are they as to how great the imbalance is. And no matter how studied you are from a technical standpoint, uh, you can still be very unstudied from a psychological standpoint, and no one is beyond reproach whenever it comes to being put in the hot box. So if you wait somebody out, if you have a keen eye for looking for physical tells, uh, social cues, whatever the case may be, that may wait their range, 
closer to bluffing or closer to value, you will be able to make better educated decision with your mixed hands, the hands that have zero EV. And it really doesn't matter what you do, right? You're just breaking even on the call or the fold. Uh, where I try not to use it too much is when I have a hand that just like always calls, right? It's like, uh, maybe I'll use it as a, as a way to calibrate my, my observation, right? Like I have a hand that always calls, so I know I'm already calling, but I'm unsure if they're bluffing or value betting. And maybe I can work a read out of that situation where I just wait them out. I look at their body posture. I look at their physicality, whatever, because I'm about to get perfect information. I know I'm calling. Right. So I'll try to like calibrate that, take all of that in, make the call and then get the, the feedback that I'm looking for. It's either going to be a bluff or a, a value. If it's a bluff, now all those points of interest I was looking at register to me, like all oh, the neck was pulsating or uh, they were breathing heavily or they, uh, they, they shot a glance at the player, to the, whatever, like whatever little subtle things you pick up on. Right. But if they have value and you notice all those cues, you now know that they mean nothing. So at a minimum, you can at least dismiss those things in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, actually another uh, question uh, from uh, Joe Coolis in the chat. Um, he's asking about solve for why. He's saying solve for why intends to teach the approach that you took in studying the game. But to understand the game at this level requires a substantial amount of both cognitive skills and discipline. Um, do you think that's really teachable? Uh, the discipline, yes, for sure. Uh, the cognitive skills, I think everybody has something to work with. So I think that dictates what your ceiling will ultimately be. Um, and no two people are alike in the sense that uh, the ceiling of a, a math genius who is hyper, um, uh, like hyper calculated along linear thought process doesn't necessarily have a higher ceiling than somebody who's a social genius right? That's a little bit weaker in the math. They just have a different methodology and a different process to getting where they want to go. Um, so I don't necessarily think that sheer raw intelligence is an indicator of a high ceiling. Uh, and as far as the discipline goes, that's why we use trainers. That's why we use charts and things of that nature. It's because it creates boundaries. We're not doing it to follow it rigidly. We're doing it to save you from yourself to protect you from whatever predisposed um, fear, like fight or flight response you have. If you're a fighter, your ranges are too wide. If you're the type to flight, then your ranges are going to be too tight and you're going to be very averse to risk. In any event, like the prescribed ranges will fix that because it'll say like, look, here's the boundary. You're two, two pips too wide or you're two pips too tight. And you don't have a justified reason to do that yet because you're not good enough. So Stick to this plan, start to understand why this boundary exists and keep training yourself into that level of discipline. Uh, I've got another one just come in from Pierre. Um, so Pierre's asking about not, I don't really have the time or the money to, to buy a solver. Um, but so what are the alternatives out there? What are, what are some of the, the cheapest ways to get studied in GTO in your opinion? Sure. Um, well, I think hiring a good coach is the easiest way, uh, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or being a part of a community and just talking to peers. Both of those things are uh, extremely uh, helpful in that regard. There are also tools out there like GTO Wizard that's a pre-solved database and they have a built-in trainer, right? So if you want to, you could just go to the trainer, you could set up spots that you feel weak in and you could just play like you're playing poker, right? You'll just get dealt a bunch of spots over and over again, and it'll grade those spots and give you the ability to like look at the solver and understand uh, how it's fail or how you're failing, how you're succeeding, things of that nature. Um, those tools uh, really do circumvent the solving process, which is good. Personally, like I don't really run Sims. I never have. Uh, I never felt a need to because I've I've always understood pretty deeply how the algorithm works, how the EV calculations are coming to be. And I could just speak with people who are very diligent at running Sims and hear their thought process, hear the patterns that they recognize, and then deduce for myself like how that applies. Like, okay, if you tell me that po small pocket pairs start to uh, turn themselves into bluffs on this category of 
of board textures, right? Like uh, we see like these, these double Broadway board textures, these uh, Jack 10 high board textures, whatever, where as the preflop aggressor, you take your small pairs and you turn them into bluffs. Well, that seems very counterintuitive. But if you tell me something like that and I sit and think about it for a while, I'll look at all the variables individually and see what allows this to take place. And what you ultimately come to realize is that the board texture changes frequently. So these small pocket pairs have a difficulty uh, realizing their equity. They also have clean outs to making a relatively nutted hand whenever you start bluffing with them and you peel off a set on turn or river. And they unblock hands that like have high enough equity that have called once or twice, but unimproved ultimately have to fold. Um, they also unblock a lot of the middling equity hands, like middle pairs and things of that nature that either auto fold on the flop uh, if they're under pairs to the board or they end up arriving at a fold on turn or river, depending. In essence, what I'm getting at is uh, I'm much more of a theoretical thinker and a, an exploitative uh, person who like applies. Whereas people who are very technically sound at this game tend to be a little bit weak in the theoretical thought, but very strong in the execution, right? So uh, what we have to understand is like, first you need to intimately know what drives you to getting better. If you're the type of person who's really good at data analysis, you should get a solver. You, sh you should just commit to getting a solver, right? If you really stink at detail-oriented stuff, but you're a big picture thinker, then you should get a coach who's detail-oriented, right? Just find the thing that complements you in this space and allows you to grow your logical process whenever you're in real time. I know Kim's got uh, one more question for us before we let you go, Matt. Um, I just want to remind our audience that uh, if you want to enter our draw at the end of the show, we're going to give away compliments of Matt Berkeley here, uh, a free month at Solve for Why. All you have to do is enter the words food bank into the chat right now. So just type uh, food bank into the chat and you'll be entered into the contest draw. Uh, Kim, what was your question? Uh, well, first, Matt, I'd like to thank you for this great coaching session. Yeah, <laughs> no fun. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually have a Matt Berkey interview question. Okay. Uh, you started this uh, friends only podcast, and mm -hmm. I just wondered how you sort of what what the origin of that was and how you can possibly do a podcast a day when I have trouble organizing one a month. Sure. Um, well, first, I'm very lucky with the team I'm surrounded by. I've already said that once, uh, and this expands out now further because you're kind of seeing the inner workings of Solve for Why with the Only Friends podcast, right? Like Brian has been the manager of Solve for Why for the better part of five years, but he's very much behind the scenes. Only attendees really get to know him. Uh, same thing with Conrad. He's been dealing these forever. Uh, his personality kind of gets to shine through. Melissa, Landon, they're my roommates. They're my friends. They're also a part of the company in some capacity. Um, so their support and the fact that there's six or seven of us makes it a lot easier. I'm the only one who really has to be consistent. So as long as I can show up five days a week, we'll have a show, right? Because some skeleton crew of the other six will be able to fill a couple seats and give me somebody to bounce ideas off of and things like that. Uh, the inspiration, I guess, was just that I saw a huge, similar to the Academy, similar to Solve for Y being born to begin with, I just saw a huge gap in the market where there are like... I think there's something like 137 poker podcasts uh, that are that are currently active and none of them are more than weekly, right? So there was literally not, not one piece of content that was daily keeping the community up to date on all the happenings uh, going on. And when Christian and I used to do the vlogcast, what would happen so frequently is we were scheduled to go every Tuesday and we stayed consistent with that. But oftentimes something would happen on Wednesday or Thursday that was incredibly relevant to the point where like we would consider just doing an emergency show to make sure that it wasn't gone and forgotten. And ultimately, if we chose not to do that, by the time next Tuesday rolled around, the story was dead. Uh, it just wasn't important anymore. And, you know, we use Twitter to get that megaphone out there and like talk to people, but it doesn't really help grow the community in the same way. Uh, so I thought this was a huge opportunity for us to become uh, a staple source in the, the community as a whole for all things poker. Uh, also, it's another arm to sell for why that can hopefully reach out to other uh, adjacent communities that uh, potentially have interest in poker. And it could be a potential uh, revenue source for us moving forward as well, because 
let's be honest. Like we've been doing this for a long time. The poker training space is amazing, but there isn't a whole lot of meat on the bone. Um, so this has been more of an exercise in learning about business, learning how to build something from scratch, how to scale and things of that nature. But uh, it certainly hasn't been a fruitful one. So if we can put together a daily show that starts to bring in outside advertisers, it starts to bring in outside communities, outside marketplaces, uh, that does a lot of heavy lifting for the company as a whole. That's great. Um, so my last question, what we're all dying to really know, uh, what week is Kenny Pickett going to start under center? Man, uh, I actually am very confident he doesn't start this year. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, you sound very confident. Okay, I was thinking like after the bye week maybe, but no, you're locked in. I, I think Trubisky is serviceable, and I think Tomlin is uh, very – I don't know if old school is the right word, but he is like just very diligent to – the notion of we have a competent vet and this kid needs to learn a pro style offense. Uh, also, I think it's kind of one of those things where it's like the more the fans cheer for Kenny, the more <laughs> Tomlin's just like, you're not going to run my team kind of thing and push yes. it back. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like it's, it's really frustrating because uh, defensively their championship caliber defense uh, offensively, they have a lot of the skill positions in place necessary to win. But their offensive line is so terrible that Ugh. they're they're a seven win team no matter who's under center, <laughs> and there's just really nothing that can be done about that. Luckily, the receiving core, the running back, super young, so we have them for a period of time where hopefully we can grow an offensive line. The defense though is aging. Uh, you know, Micah, he's still he's still in his prime, but like three to five good years left. Cam Hayward's going to be retiring soon. We have JJ locked up, which is great, but. Uh, you know, you're going to start to see some turnover at the linebacker core. I think we're going to lose Devin Bush after this year, uh, things of that nature. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I'll take any bets. Anyone who thinks he's starting before the bye week, I'll take your money. I still think we might see him later this year, but I think you're right. I wouldn't want to ruin the guy getting him started behind this offensive line either. All right, that's enough of that, uh, says Kim. Um, Matt, where can folks uh, get a hold of you? How can they join uh, uh, everything that you've got going on at Solve for Why? What's the best place for people to reach you when they want to connect? Because a lot of folks are going to listen to this and say, I got to get me more of that Matt Berkey, man. Sure, sure. Uh, so on social media, I'm Berkey11 everywhere. Uh, on Twitter, we are Solve for Why at Solve for Why TV. Uh, on Instagram, I think we're at Solve for Why Academy. Um, you can check out the, the Solve for Why training site at solveforwhy.io. Uh, free two-week trial to anybody who signs up. If you sign up for the yearly, uh, we're actually giving away uh, Homeschool 2.0 with mm. the yearly subscription. So uh, for anybody interested in that, that's a 36-hour course, I believe, that was led by myself, Matt Hunt, Andrew Brokus, uh, Landon Tice, uh, Jesse Sylvia, and Russell Thomas. Um, so a lot of great coaches uh, <laughs> yeah. under that umbrella. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the best things that I think we've done um, so yeah, for anybody interested, uh, we're, we're happy to have you. Otherwise we put out some free content on YouTube. There's also a free membership at software.io, uh, called the, uh, free roll access pass where, uh, you can see like Academy footage and, uh, the to be determined movie. That's wonderful. Well, uh, Matt, I feel like everyone who listened to the show got smarter. We all know more about poker. I think we all know we have a lot more questions to ask and things to learn. So that's always a good sign. Um, so thank you again for coming on. I can't wait to bend your ear another time uh, soon, I hope. Sure. Happy to have it. All right, my friend. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, we're going to keep on rolling, talk about some home games and uh, other stuff that's getting exciting over here. But folks, do uh, go check out uh, Matt on Twitter. Check out the Academy. Tell them that you had a great time on the Rec Poker podcast. And then we'll reel him back in here another time soon and, and pick his amazing uh, poker brain again. Thank All you, guys. Right. Have a good one. Cheers. Really appreciate it. Well, that was a good. I mean, you don't often get a chance. Like, that felt like a tutorial, didn't it, gang? I just love soaking up the, the genius poker knowledge that we get from some of these guests. It's amazing. Definitely sounded like a coaching session. Yeah. <laughs> I think think if you go back and just take all of Matt Berkey's uh, when he's been on the poker podcast, our poker podcast, Rec Poker Podcast, and take Ryan LaPlante's mm. when he's been on, and take those just so take those two guys, take these podcasts, and you've got quite a training program right there. Yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> you true. Really do. No, it's really really impressive stuff. Um, 
So we're going to talk a little bit about, and I know we've got to let Chris Jones go soon because we're recording our monthly seminar later tonight. Um, so we'll just go through some home game results and then we'll do our uh, food bank drive uh, uh, draw. So it's not too late. Just toss the words food bank into the chat here in the YouTube chat, and then we'll see who's our winner of a free month at Solve for Y. So John, what's been going on in home game land over the last little while, the last week to be exact. And I'll remind you that you are muted. Well, I find it's easier to talk when I'm not muted. So <laughs> it's easier for us to listen. I know that. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it might be worse for you. Ah, here he goes. There but he anyway, goes. Um, on September 19th, Poker Geek MN, John Somsky Whoa. won his seventh nightly victory for the year. His Even eighth a overall. Blind squirrel, huh? How exactly. does that happen? Rigged. Well, <laughs> if you remember, <laughs> at the beginning of the year <laughs> i pronounced that i was half as good as jacob kiki <laughs> and that i would win 10 games this year i am on pace for that so there you go that's that that's that's impressive then on uh september 20th now then kb won his seventh nightly victory for nice. the year east coast spitter ben enslow won his third nightly victory for the year carl 0621 won his fourth nightly victory for the year and none other than stewie 13 won his hey. eighth nightly victory for the year nice and not to be outdone keck geek senior won his sixth nightly victory for the year amazing then in mixed uh. events k poker wannabe ron payton won his first mixed daily mixed event for the year uh, Magra 44 came back and won his fourth international event for the year. He's back. And then Rick the Good Dog. Oh, my God. Won his second international victory for the year. Does Does Rick the Good Dog ever enter tournaments and then not win those tournaments? Has anyone I, seen that happen? I believe he has not won every tournament he has played. No, I've, I've seen him. I've seen him go out once or twice in the home game. <laughs> before winning so i of course so i might i might have been so i might have been imagining it yeah, <laughs> yeah. and we got a comment in the chat here uh, john uh benjamin enslow got his full name this week he's he, he was listening last week there you go yeah and that's because he went to his profile and he made the things public that needed to be public and now his <laughs> name is there anyone can do that anyone can do it uh, and then for the LPP Sunday event, Poker Stars decided that there was just too much going on and yep. canceled the tournament. Wasn't a big day for them anyway, so no big, uh, no big loss. Just chalk it Ooh, up there. That was that was a rough Yee. one. Yeah, I know. Uh, speaking of Ben Enslow, he was doing pretty well in uh, a shot taking tournament that got canceled. So I hope they took care of him. But that's 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 always yeah. so disappointing. That's a bummer. They did. He yeah. posted it in uh, in the Discord channel. Awesome. That he did get paid. Um, so yeah, they were they did a, a ICM chop basically yep. with whoever, you know, that's how they that's how they do it. So yeah, still that stinks. Um, all right. Well, I think we've got eight uh people that have entered the draw, um, starting with the RRR CCC and uh the RRR CCC. I got an email from you uh claiming your prize from last week. I am sorry it's taken me so long to get back to you. I am just a little overwhelmed with emails and other things right now, so I am behind. But uh full credit for that. I'll be in touch shortly about how to claim that prize. Uh, but we're gonna roll the die here. We got the magical nerdy eight-sided die because there's eight people in the draw. Start with uh, the RRR CCC and work down from there. What do we got? It's a one again. Oh my God. Uh, we're going to have to start doing this like with the camera on the die because we're rolling ones at a freaking unsustainable rate. Like I, I would, I don't blame the listeners that are getting suspicious. Um, but as Chris Jones has pointed out, as Chris Jones has pointed out, it just means you got to be the first one to type your name in for the draw. Type it in fast, and yep. it makes your life easier now because the RRCC has to that's just right. get a, a, two prizes there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I give one email, but yeah, way to go. So um, uh, this this play this uh, free 
YouTube viewer has showed up for uh, two interviews. They've won a free month at Rec Poker and a free month at Solve for Why. Like it just goes to show, holy cow, folks, come and join the Rec Poker podcast for free every Monday evening at 730 Eastern on YouTube. And obviously, I would love it if you would just do what Donna Dark Angel says down there and uh, click the old like and subscribe button. Oh, God, it feels weird saying that out loud, but it means a lot to us. We really do appreciate it. So thank you very much for that. Um, let me see. I think, uh, Kim, I don't know if we have time to get into all the fun that's happening down in Cleveland. I know you're our foreign traveling correspondent right now, but can you confirm that you final tabled uh, an exciting tournament and, and got to sniffing distance of a ring uh, this week? Yeah, event number two of the Run Good Poker Series in mm. Cleveland, mm. Uh, Ohio. Um, there's a few uh, rec poker members down here, so hopefully I'll run into all of them. There you uh, go. I did uh, final table and ended up heads up, although we made an ICM chop at four, four-handed. So I didn't get the ring, almost got the ring. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, wait, like one I'm away sorry. from the ring That's yeah so. <laughs> well it, it's just there to keep keep you keep driving on it'll be there waiting for you when when the time is right um, but congratulations i'm glad you're having fun down there we love the run good uh poker tour and, and um uh, veronica brill who's coming down to cleveland to join you and some of our friends has told us if you're wearing any rec poker gear and you go up to her and say hello, she is contractually obligated to buy you a beer. So don't let that opportunity pass you by, folks. If you're listening to this live, um, it's Monday night, September 26th. You still got tons of time to go bug Veronica and get your free rec poker beer. Look, premium and membership only not... costs 15 bucks. Like, think about the beer yeah. rebate on that. Yeah. yeah, they're not free in this casino. So oh, yeah, it's there you go. It's cost her high-end <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Uh, and Joe Cool says uh, you want a ring in my book, Kim. Uh, so there you go. You got some fans in the in the YouTube chat. Okay, Thanks, we got to let we got to let Chris roll out of here. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. The last piece of news I'm going to break is um, the, the the time comes for all things. I have so much enjoyed listening to that tune as we roll into and out of our podcast every week. But we actually have brand new podcast bumper music. Uh, brought to you by Steve Fredlin's old buddy, uh, Pete, who uh, we actually thought was the original uh, music creator as well. There's a long story there, but long story short, I'm so excited that we were able to get together with Pete and uh, he's produced some uh, awesome new bumper music for the podcast. So starting next week, you will hear the new intro, but just to get you uh, get a little taste of it, we're going to start you with the, the new outro. Um, so enjoy this. And while you're doing that, I want to thank our amazing uh, sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel Race Jacket Casino, and Mark Krishan at Website Amp, and Matt freaking Burton. Are you kidding? Yeah. So thank you to all of them, and thank you to you, the listeners. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everybody. And thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>